Thank you and uh, good evening. I hope I can uh, talk a little bit about uh, the actual program that has to be set up to make this a successful endeavor and procedure because it doesn't just happen. I just want to explain to you a little bit how the procedure works, you know, how you get somebody through this because you've heard that you should expect some problems. And, you know, five or ten years ago, uh, as a bronchoscopist or pulmonologist, when an asthma patient came across your practice and you thought about a bronchoscopy for some other reason, it was not exactly what you wanted to do, and you really were thinking about reasons not to. Anything was a good reason not to do a bronchoscopy on an asthmatic. And now we're talking about uh, doing this as a therapeutic intervention. So this is a real change of paradigm, and uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes really going through how this works in a little bit more detail. Uh, the FDA approval for this is for adults, as you've uh, heard and seen uh, in patients with uh, severe asthma, not approved yet for children. And um, the procedure is bronchoscopy-based. That It's a catheter-based system that goes through the bronchoscopic working channel. Uh, it's aimed, as you've seen, to reduce the smooth muscle mass. So it's really not designed to do any other active intervention in your airways. And it's really done whenever you can as an outpatient procedure. So it should be the exception that a patient is admitted at the uh, end of this. Uh, it is really complementary uh, to what you're doing right now in the medical management of patients. You know, we're really learning uh, how this will change the use of uh, the medications you would usually think about uh, for your patients. Uh, but right now, think of it as uh, complementary and something that helps in the control. So you've seen this. This is a normal airway. Everybody has airway smooth muscle. Uh, what sets the asthmatic airway apart is that you have more, that you develop hypertrophy uh, in the airways after a period of time. And it is the feeling that this is what contributes to an actual asthma attack and the ability of the airway to really, or the propensity, you would want to say, of the airway to constrict. So it makes some mechanistic sense to say, okay, we need to treat the inflammation, but if we can decrease the muscle mass, the ability, really the architecture required to decrease uh, the airway diameter, it should be helpful. This is what you need. I assume, you know, the bronchoscope is actually available in the unit that does that. But the catheter-based system on the left, you've seen that uh, in a picture before. But this is what the catheter actually looks like. Uh, it has this almost basket-looking thing at the end that with a handle mechanism is activated, so it's usually straight, and if you push a handle, it uh, expands until it gets in contact with the airway wall, and it is through these contact areas here that you can see that it appear, appears slightly naked, uh, that the actual energy is delivered to the airway wall. The controller itself is on the right. It's kept pretty simple, so we can't play with any buttons and cause any trouble. This is an animation before I show you uh, an actual image. Uh, bronchoscopy, most of the time, is performed with the help of a flexible bronchoscope. Uh, these bronchoscopes are about five or six millimeters in diameter. That's a usual one. Uh, this is a working channel that's two millimeters wide. This is where this comes out. I showed you how this is expanded now in contact with the airway wall. And once the energy is delivered, for about eight to ten seconds, you see that here, over about five millimeters in uh, length, uh, you deliver it again and keep pulling it back. So it looks pretty simple, but you obviously have to get started you know, from fairly distal, work your way back, and I'll show you a little bit about the roadmap that we're using for that. Now that I've shown it to you in an animation, this is what this actually looks like in real life. Should go here, yeah. Here's the actual catheter. You advance it, keep the basket basically still in view as far as you can. 
And this is an indication, the sound that you hear right now, that you have contact and that energy is delivered. End. Now you pull it back, those five millimeters, and this is where these bands help you to gauge that. I want to encourage the company to use a different uh, beat to this, you know, because it gets a little lengthy after a while. But um, as you can see, you know, you have to really be fairly meticulous if you want to treat this properly to pull it back uh, in regular intervals. Uh, I'm just showing you four, but one treatment generally consists somewhere in the around 40 to 60, maybe 70 activation range. So who do we do that in? And who are the appropriate patients we should think about in using this for? Uh, you've heard about the data that's been presented, so we are really looking for the patients who have severe asthma. We are not really looking for the patients who are well controlled, need very little medication, are doing well, and are leading a normal life. We are looking for the patients who keep coming back into your offices. They're well medicated. Uh, but their quality of life has really decreased. They have side effects from their medications and really are looking for other options. Um, obviously, it is necessary that on top of everything that we talked about, that these patients are safe to undergo a bronchoscopy because you have three of those. Uh, this may have not been completely clear during the presentation, but it's not a one-time treatment. Uh, you have to, in order to avoid significant complications, split this up into three treatments uh, separated by three weeks. So you have to be really able to undergo that treatment without problems. So what are the contraindications? What do we think about in patients uh, who should not have a bronchoscopy in the first place? So patients who are baseline hypoxic, patients who can't tolerate the medications that you require for the bronchoscopy or the sedation, and other things that can be an issue include pacemakers, internal defibrillators, things that could interfere uh, with the radiofrequency energy that's being delivered. You also shouldn't do a bronchoscopy in somebody who has an active infection. So the timing becomes important. Patients should not have an active infection, active exacerbation. They should be stable for the period of the procedure. And that is why we're looking for these things. You know, make sure that they are not on antibiotics right now, that they're not coughing up yellow sputum, have a fever, or are in the middle of an asthma attack. I mean, these kinds of things obviously need to be addressed, and we need to make sure that treatments actually get delayed if need be. That's all fine. As I told you, we're doing three treatments. Uh, generally, we do the right lower lobe first. And, you know, I keep always telling people EGDs are easy if you're a gastroenterologist because there's what, just one tube. You know, you just um, go in one, end up at the other end of that tube, but airways keep splitting up. It's like an upside down tree. So it actually becomes somewhat complicated when you stand there and you've seen this with the catheter. You're in some sub, sub, sub segment. It all looks the same. You should be treating all of them. So it becomes important to have really somebody almost next to you and has having this map really checked off, making sure that you're not treating one sub segment twice and another one not at all. Um, but in order to make sure that this all goes um, according to plan, you want to really follow this and do right low lobe in one setting, wait three weeks, make sure everything that you've heard about that can happen settles down. Then you do the left lower lobe in the next setting. And three weeks later, if everything else is okay, you do the two upper lobes. So from a timing point of view, uh, that all plays a role. So it's not just that somebody comes in, has a procedure, goes home. Uh, you are really talking about sort of a 12-week process uh, from the time you've seen a patient to the first procedure, time in between, second procedure, time in between, third, and follow-up. So generally, what we do is... Uh, patient gets referred, we see the patient, say, yes, you're a good candidate, we schedule the procedure. About one week before that happens, we get back together one more time, often over the phone, make sure that everything is still stable. No infection, no anything that we just talked about. A patient then gets started 
on steroids as a boost three days before the procedure because we know that they will have problems from the procedure for a day or two. Um, the day the patient shows up, you get another set of PFTs just to make sure yet again that the, air fun that the, the uh, airways and the uh, respiratory function are stable. Then the actual procedure, the bronchoscopy, the lidocaine, the sedation, and that procedure generally takes about 40 minutes. So by the time a patient goes into the bronch unit, as the procedure and comes out, you have to bank on about an hour and a half. So it becomes important to think about the logistics of all this, that you can get the testing done in the morning, have the procedure uh, performed, and then monitor the patient. That's fairly standard. Usually two to four hours after somebody had sedation, you follow them, but you have to get another set of PFTs in to make sure that there is no variation that is greater than 80%, because that then would lead to the patient either being observed longer or maybe admitted. So it becomes very important how you schedule this and that you set up a system that can really accommodate the logistics of all this. We have a nurse practitioner and a nurse who really concentrate on that program because um, they basically exchange phone numbers with the patients. As you can see here, day one, day two, it's usually also because our nurse is very focused on this, day three, four, and five, that there will be phone calls just to make sure everything is okay, questions get answered, and uh, you can lead into the second procedure and then the third one without running into trouble. And we basically guide the patient through these three months. Uh, we don't take over the uh, management of the asthma before or after. So the patient comes, goes through the procedure, and then generally uh, goes back to the referring uh, physician. Um, we in our unit generally just ask to see the patient every six or 12 months to make sure that there are no procedure-related issues uh, that come up. So this is my favorite patient. Uh, this was our first one when we introduced the clinical uh, post-FDA approval. She's 64. Uh, we uh, performed the procedure about half a year ago, and she has had severe asthma all her life. Uh, really a lot of exacerbation. Basically no unscheduled physician visits because she had a standing visit once a week almost with her doc, so she could just show up and really a life-altering experience uh, for her, this disease, because even though she wouldn't necessarily always have an exacerbation when she would want to do something, she just didn't do it anymore out of fear that something uh, would happen. And um, her quote is that she couldn't blow out a candle. So she underwent treatment. She did great. She had no real problems throughout. And this is what Jerry talked about, the every now and then the feedback that we have provided some life-altering intervention. Doesn't really happen all that often, but really can keep you in the game and made me very excited about this because after the first treatment already, she said, this is different, I'm better. You know, she did not use her rescue medications anymore. She came for her second, she came then for her third treatment and did wonderfully. Uh, she has not used her, her albuterol inhaler at all and really has made it her mission to let others know about this. She went on national television, uh, on the doctor's show and everything uh, to really talk about what that meant for her. So it was really uh, a great experience also for us as a team uh, to participate in that. What is always on everybody's mind is uh, coverage issues for this, which especially applies obviously to the hospital and the treating uh, bronchoscopist. Right now, this is an evolution. Uh, policies and payment uh, do vary, and they vary from state to state. Um, so if you have any specific questions, I would have to refer you really uh, to the company to have those discussions, because that is not in my uh, area of expertise.